Hey, welcome to the Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg. So good to be with you again in our Wandering, Walking Through the Word series. Uh, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe and on YouTube, and uh, that way we can get more of this out to folks. And uh, we have left history behind. We have finished with the historical books, um, leaving us at uh, Nehemiah and uh, the end of Chronicles, where the, uh, the Israelites have returned from exile. But this time during the exile has been very fruitful. And one of the things that was accomplished during this time of exile was the compilation of a Jewish hymn book called Psalms, and the wisdom literature. And the wisdom literature is a, a, a number of different books, starting with uh, Job, and then Psalms, and Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and Psalm, Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. And all of these books are, are meant to be reflective, meant to be uh, read over and over again, absorbed devotionally, uh, sung. Uh, and, and so when we read wisdom, wisdom literature, it's designed to be read over and over again, and not just once. Um, there's lots of allegory, metaphors, simile. Uh, think of poetry. Poetry uh, it uses a lot of these literary elements in order to get bigger meanings across and, and bigger thoughts across. Um, be less concerned with details. Like, um, be, be more concerned with meaning when you're reading wisdom literature. So an example of Psalm 33, 6 says, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, all the stars by the breath of his mouth. So, uh, does God have breath? Does he breathe? Uh, well, this is using a metaphor of breath to relay spirit, to relay the creative force behind God. Um, you also may have to dig into back into history in order to understand some of the wisdom literature. So ex example, Psalm 51, which, uh, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Um, you know, David is pleading for mercy for the sin that he committed against Uriah the Hittite and against Bathsheba. And uh, you, you would have to know 2 Samuel 11 through 12 in order to understand Psalm 51. So be ready to jump back into history a little bit to understand some of it. So I'm going to be taking this a little bit differently. Um, I'm not going to start with Job and then move through the the rest of the uh, wisdom literature because three of the books and that's job and proverbs and ecclesiastes kind of go together there's some themes there and so i'm going to get to that later what i am going to start with though is with song of songs oh my goodness song of songs so solomon may have written it um it's more likely that it was written in the tradition of Solomon. Um, and so when you re are reading it, you're thinking, well, which one of his, you know, hundreds of wives and concubines is he talking about here? You know, so it makes it a little less likely that it was Solomon that wrote this book, but somebody under his wisdom literature tradition wrote it. But it's still an important book. Um, there are three ways of interpreting this book. There's the Jewish tradition, which is an allegory of God's love for Israel. And then there's the Christian tradition, which is an allegory of God's love for the church. And then there is sort of the uh, plain spoken, plain meaning, which is it's just a collection of ancient love and erotic poetry. Yeah, you heard me right. There's a erotic poetry in the Bible. Song of Solomon's is kind of racy sometimes, and so you know you can you. I think you can take any one of those interpretations. I kind of fall into the third one that this is just a collection of ancient love poetry that is talking about how love between man and woman is is so holy and unique and special. Um. You read 
the Song of Songs to enjoy the literary depth of the book. This is really important. The whole focus of the book, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, is about love and that love is everlasting and it's self-sacrificial. Uh, the focus is not on the physical act of love because throughout as you're reading it the, the man and the woman are calling to each other and they get really close and then they separate again and they start calling to each other and they get close and then they separate again. The focus is not the physical act of love but it's the state of love. Other poetry of that period gets into graphic detail about the physical act of love, but Song of Solomon doesn't. It talks about the self-sacrificial kind of love that these two have for each other. And then there's lots of garden imagery as well of how humans, man and woman, are to exist in love. So that's, that's pretty much all I'm going to have on Song of Solomon. Um, worthy to read it? Read it as a Jewish person, God talking about Israel. Read it as a Christian person, God talking about the church. Or read it for what it kind of is, and that is a, uh, a book of love poetry. And that's going to bring us to the Psalms. And the Psalms are a wonderful, wonderful collection of writings. They're a collection of uh, poems, of songs, uh, half of them, about half, were written by David. Um, other psalms were written before David. Some psalms were written during the exile. Some psalms were written after the exile. Uh, there are two genres of psalms. There's lots of different kinds, but essentially they fall into two different kinds. The first one is a Psalms of Lament. Uh, Psalms of Lament talk about pain and suffering, uh, the blues. You know, if somebody, if you listen to blues music like I do, I love blues music. And somebody says, well, how can you be a Christian and listen to blues music? It's so sad. Well, have you ever read Psalm 88? That's a sad psalm. All the Songs of Lament have some sort of bright spot you know, at the end, focusing on, you know, God's provision, except for Psalm 88. That ends kind of darkly. But be that as it may, you know, there's Psalms of Lament, and this is the heart's cry, because the Psalms are man writing to God. Almost all of the Bible is God speaking to humanity. But with the Psalms, it's humanity speaking to God. The other genre of psalms is praise, joy and celebration. Uh, psalm 136, his love, his chased endures forever. And remember that word chased because next week we're going to have a sermon on that particular word and how it's important to the psalms. Be that as it may, those two genres predominant, predominantly throughout the book of Psalms. There's, there's a structure to the Psalms. So after the exile, the Psalms were compiled and arranged to a structure into a book. And there's an introduction and an ending. The, the introduction is Psalms 1 and 2. Um, the Psalms is the new Torah and the Messiah. The Psalms is a prayer book for Yahweh's faithful. And then the ending, Psalms 146 through 150, all start with Hale Yahweh, or Hale Yahweh, or Hallelujah. Hale Yahweh, remember Yahweh is the name of God. Hale means all praise. Hale Yahweh, hallelujah. So Psalms 146 through 150 is a collection of praise hymns. They're beautiful, beautiful praise hymns. So that's the introduction to ending. Now there's, Psalms are split into different sections. So book one is uh, Psalm 90 through 106. I'm sorry, uh, 
I'm sorry, book one is Psalms 3 through 41. And it talks about the love of the Torah, Yahweh's word to his people. Book two is Psalms 42 through 72. And it talks a lot about in their hope for the future. Now, do all of the Psalms talk about that in either one of these? No, but the predominant majority of the Psalms do. Uh, book three in the Psalms, the fall of David and exile. Yeah, this is that's a tough section. Book four, uh, Psalms 90 through 106. This reestablishes Yahweh as Israel's God. Book five, Psalms 107 through 145 is the promise of a messianic kingdom. Um, each of the books has subdivisions as well. So I really encourage you as you're reading through Psalms, know where you're at, know what section you're in. Gives you an idea of what the author of the Psalm is talking about. All the books end with something like, blessed be the Lord forever, amen. All, that's where you know the end of the book is. Blessed Baruch be the name of the Lord Yahweh forever, amen, amen. Now, the last thing I want to mention about Psalms uh, before we finish for today is uh, the Messianic Psalms. Now, what are the Messianic Psalms? The Messianic Psalms are Psalms that point directly to Messiah. And as Christians, after the resurrection of Jesus, and as the new Christians in the new church went to the Psalms as their prayer book, they noticed that there were a number of Psalms that pointed to Jesus, that pointed to Jesus very strongly. So 16 of them are direct prophecies about Jesus. So Psalm 2, let's go there. Let's go to Psalm 2. And uh, let's, let's read a few verses from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers conspire together against the Lord and his, who? Anointed one. Anointed one. How do you say anointed one in Hebrew? Mashiach or Messiah. The Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off the chains, throw the ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them, and he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king of Zion, the holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son, and today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them in an iron scepter. You shall shatter them like poetry. So now kings be wise, receive instruction, you judges, judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the sun or he will be angry at, and you will perish on, in your rebellion for his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are happy. So here is a psalm that's talking about Jesus and not the nice fluffy Jesus we sometimes see in uh, media. This is a, a Jesus who is God's son, who is making sure that justice is going to happen on this earth for evil. Um, Psalm 22. This is another good one. So we're going to go to Psalm 22. And I won't read all of it because it's kind of long. But maybe this might sound familiar to you if you've read the Gospels and if you've read towards the end of the Gospels as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says something very interesting. And Psalm 22 starts, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night. Yet I have no rest. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and they were set free. They trusted in you and you and were not disgraced. Uh, there's uh, another part in here. Let me just find it real quick. 
But anyway, uh, many bulls surround me, starting at verse 12. Strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. Think about the crucifixion scene when I read this. I am poured out like water. Remember the guard with the spear into the side. I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Again, imagine Jesus on the cross here. You put me into the dust of death for dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. Psalm 22 is a pretty strong uh, pointer to Jesus. Uh, so, again, there are 16 psalms, and let me just list them out for you. Psalm 2, 8, 16, 22, 23, 24, 40, 41, 45, 68, 69, 72, 89, 102, 110, and 118. So I've listed them there for you. Write them down, and I encourage you, go read them. And uh, see where Jesus is popping up in there. The Psalms is an amazing, amazing collection of books. Read it, reread it. I read the Psalms every day. I read a different part of the Bible every day, but I always read a Psalm because it draws me. It draws me into the heart of God. It draws me into his dwelling place. Um, so that's it for now. This is Chaplain Greg. If, if you are enjoying this series,